Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter uh, 9. So I've spent the last month on a series called Unto Us. And we've been covering in Isaiah chapter 9, specifically verse 6, of the declaration of a coming child that God had planned to come 700 years later than this proclamation, this prophecy. And we started off talking about how Isaiah declares Jesus to be this wonderful counselor who's our guide and, and our light, who lights up our path in our lives. Then we spoke to, about how he is a mighty God. In the midst of everything, the strength that God has, how he gives us the power and the, the spiritual vitality in us to grow and to walk a closer walk, to meet the needs of this chaotic world that we, that we live in today. Last Sunday, we talked about him being an everlasting father. And I, I guess when I, I put that together last week after going back and, and, and reading my notes and listening to the, the message from last week, I, I, didn't, I guess I didn't at the time grasp the full impact of the meaning of that everlasting father. Even as I preached about it, I didn't really grasp the full impact. But we emphasize how Jesus was this example of, of manhood, how he was the perfect example of fatherhood, and how as somebody that we could aspire to follow after as a role model on what it really means as a father. And the biggest thing is, is how he never fails us. He's always right with us, walking beside us in the midst of everything. Who's ever felt alone before? You ever felt alone? Guess what? You weren't because Jesus was right there with you. See, that's who Jesus is. As an everlasting father to the orphan child or to the fatherless child, he was that father that was always going to be there. And in a time of struggles, Isaiah was letting them know that, hey, there's coming one that's going to take care of you. And when I started this this series, I had two goals in mind, and the first goal was actually the second goal, which was to kind of remove the, the commercialism of, Christian, of Christmas and bring it back to the altars, bring it back to the, to the manger, back where it belongs on this wonderful gift that was given to us, that God gave us. And I, I brought it up yesterday in, my, in our brief devotion online that, you know, the greatest gift that we had with Jesus Christ was given to us. And the greatest gift we can give God is to receive that gift. Who here likes to give gifts? Does anybody struggle receiving gifts? I would rather give gifts. I like watching the facial expressions and stuff. But the one time that you can be excited to receive a gift is when, because God gave us Jesus. And as we receive Christ into our lives and we begin to live our lives for him, we start to understand the wonderful counselor, the guidance he gives us, the, the mighty God, that protection and that strength, and the everlasting father that is always one with us, watching over us. So today we're going to wrap this up in the fourth title he gave Jesus, and that is the Prince of Peace. So let's start reading in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. I'll be reading out of the English Standard Version. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter times, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and a government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In the increase of his government and of peace, 
there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with the righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Father God, we ask that you just captivate our hearts and our minds over these next few moments. That as we grasp over these last few weeks of the wonderful counselor, the mighty God and the everlasting Father, that we come to the realization that Prince of Peace and what that means in our lives today. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You got to step back one chapter in Isaiah chapter 8 to grasp a full concept of, of chapter 9. As there was this terrible prophecy that was given of, of doom and of gloom and of destruction for Ephraim and it involved Judah as well. Could you imagine you're being told that the enemy is going to come and destroy you and all you have is doom and gloom in front of you. And you hear no bright spot in life. I think of this young boy that was uh, killed here this past week. At nine years old, beaten to death, basically, by a, I guess they classify her as a stepmom. Um, I guess my discouragement in the whole thing is how mom let it happen. I think that young man didn't know peace. Because that was going on at nine years old. It was probably going on earlier than that too. It's hard to, it was hard to hear that. Because no child deserves that. I imagine all he knew was doom and gloom in his life. That he didn't know what uh, uh, the safety of a father or mother was in his life. And the, the Israelites in this time... We're struggling with safety. They're struggling with, they get this prophetic word spoken over them of, of doom and of gloom. See, the, the Assyrians were, were raiding the northern kingdom. They're conquering all the territories around. They were causing terror. They were causing uh, Israel and, and attacking the eastern borders. And they're causing all this strife within this, within the country. I think at times in my life, it feels like it's just one attack after the other. It's like, what is coming next? Yeah. After these last two years, praise God, we're still here. We're still standing. And I, I think we exemplify what, what James says, that those who endure to the end, Amen. there's a crown of life waiting for you. Amen. And Lord knows <laughs> if you're alive today, if you've endured a lot over the last two years. And for this church, we've endured a lot over just the last four months. We were blessed not to have to deal a lot with COVID until, until September hit. And just been one thing after another in the body of Christ here. But we're still here. And we're still praising God that regardless of what's happened, he's still on his throne. He's still watching over us. Amen. But during this tragedy that was happening, as you get into chapter 9, God issues this promise through through Isaiah and what God is saying that in the midst of all this defeat you see all this this struggle and this hardship that these troubled times God was basically telling them don't be afraid just have some courage have a little joy in your life that's why James says count it all joy in the midst of trials and tribulations He's telling them this. God's telling us because one of these days, see, one of these days, you're going to have some freedom going to come. There's going to be relief that's going to come. There's going to be all these problems that are going to go away. But the way you get this freedom is not going to be in a way that you could ever think or you can ever imagine. And when you look at his prophecy, one of the things we have to take into consideration is the makeup of Israel. You have the northern kingdom under King, da under King David's uh, grandson, Jeroboam. He had 10 of the 12 tribes. But the problem with this kingdom was they didn't seem to like to do the things that God wanted them to do. Did evil. This king did evil. This king did evil. This king did evil. And all of a sudden comes along a king that says he did, this king did good. But that king was very few and far between. And finally, basically what happened was God got tired of it. It says it's time we start shaking some things up. The southern part, 
Rehob, I always mess this guy's name up. Rehoboam, if I pronounce that right. Rehoboam, there we go, that's probably right there. Formed a southern kingdom called Judah, which is where the other two tribes were. See, the northern kingdom, Samaria, was the capital. In the southern kingdom, it was Jerusalem. And it's this northern kingdom in chapter 9 that, that Isaiah is referring to. And they had this rocky history since, this, since the split happened. As each king led them down a different path towards sin, towards idolization, towards a worship of somebody else besides God. These kings had the, the posture of a believer but they didn't have the insides of a believer. They had the posture, the outside emphasis on following the, the rules of God, but we're not going to live our lives that way. And each, each king came in and they got worse and they got worse and they got worse. And we see that in our society today. We see that in our government in the country today. From 30, 40 years ago to where it is today, it got worse, it's gotten worse, it's gotten worse. It may have leveled off a little bit, but steadily has gotten worse. And because they had this lack of, I guess, spiritual leadership, you should say, there was this rapid descent into idolatry into worshiping other gods than the one true God. And they saw this, and then because of this, they saw nation after nation attack them, plunder them and enslave them. After almost a century of these wars, brought this up last week about the everlasting father, Israel started coming across a problem. That all their men were gone. All the fathers were gone because they'd been in war and they died. And you had these generations being raised up, fatherless. Many of the women were, that were taken into captivity, that the Assyrians would marry that woman and take on the children, the Israelite children. But these children became second rate. But God. It's one line I put in my notes. But God. Amen. Then in the midst of everything, in the midst of the struggles... But God, call upon me and I'll answer you, is what he says. I'll show you great and mighty things. You can't imagine a, a, a path through this mess. God says, that's great, that's where I want you. Because his word says in Ephesians 3.20, that he'll do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you can ask or imagine. So when you can't imagine your path through the mess, you can't imagine the strife being gone or the struggles or the pain being gone. What you can realize is you are now in position for God to work. You are now in a place that he's going to take what is unimaginable and turn it into something that's imaginable. That no matter what you see, you can remember the greater is he that's within you than he that's within this world. We face an enemy that wants to kill and steal and destroy you, but we serve a God that wants to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. And his word declares that he cannot change, he cannot lie. So when God says it, he means it. And when God means it, he's going to do it for us. Amen? Amen. And so what he says, what God says, but God, he says, I'm going to send you a child that's going to deliver you. I can imagine your thoughts. A child. A baby. We don't have time to wait 30 years or 20 years for this baby to grow up. He says, but I'm going to tell you what though. This child I'm going to give you. You're going to look at him. He's going to be a wonderful counselor. I declare this child I give you is going to be a, a mighty God and an everlasting father. But to a nation in, in turmoil, he's going to be a prince of peace for you. And if we can grasp hold of this concept of who Jesus is, it will not only change our view on Christmas, but it will change our entire life. That's why he called him a, a prince of peace. But you have to ask, what is peace? If you go out and talk to 100 people, if I ask everybody in this room today what peace is, I may get a few of the same answers, but we're going to have many different answers on what peace is. It's important for us, though, to grasp 
Not just what we view peace as, but what God views peace as. And since God is the, the source of all existence and all reality, it behoove us to go to him first to find the answer of peace. And it is this, and it'll be up on the screen. Biblical peace is more than just the absence of conflict. It is the action, take, it is taking action to restore a broken situation. Think of Israelite, Israel's time right now. They're in a broken situation. Being attacked, being attacked, being taken off into slavery. They're men dying. There wasn't peace in this world at their time. It's more than just a state of inner tranquility. We'll go to yoga class and we'll connect some way, shape, or form with something that will empty us out. If we just empty, that's yoga, that's Mediterranean yoga. Just empty everything out in you and sit there and meditate. I like the biblical view is how about we empty everything out and start filling it with the word of God within us and start fighting back to the enemies that we fight with what God's word says in our, about us and who we are as the children of God. That he fights for us, he protects us, for us to realize he's never lost a battle. So take heart in your situation. He's not going to lose your battle either. Amen. And if you allow him to fight it for you, it's a key there. You got to allow him to do it. You won't lose either. Oh, you may feel bruised and battered, but I guarantee you, you're going to win. I don't know about you, but I like being a winner. I don't like being a loser. That's no fun. But I got God on my side. Hmm. No weapon formed me shall prosper. Hallelujah. It also says a biblical peace is not something we can create on our own, but it's a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians, it tells us that peace is one of the fruit of the Spirit. That is given to us. Do you have peace today in your life? Do you have peace in your situations of what you're going through in life to know that God's going to take care of it? That first part says the biblical peace is more than just an absence of conflict. See, that's what was going on in Israel. It was conflict after conflict. And I talk to people every single day. It seems like all there is in their family is conflict. All there is in their family is, is struggles and hardship. And all they want is peace. All they want is a broken family, the broken situation to be restored back to what God intended for the family. And it's, you got to put this in context of what was going on at this time in history was that there was conflict, there was brokenness, families were torn apart, the country was being torn apart, and all they wanted was peace. It's all they wanted for the last 100 years. I just want peace. The kingdom was in a constant state of war, constant state of rebellion, constant state of disobedience from God. And over and over again, God sent prophets to them to lead them and to guide them, to warn them of, of what was coming, this disaster. He said it to them over and over again, but the people constantly rejected the words and sometimes even kill them. You ever done that? You've got somebody that's coming to you with struggles and hardships and you're giving the best spiritual advice that you know you can give, but it seems like all they do is reject it. But they keep coming back and keep asking the same question over and over again. Isn't that the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. I know so many people, I've talked to so many people, and that's their life. They live in this constant state of drama. They don't want the drama, and they'll tell you they don't want the drama, but they can't deliver themselves, get themselves out of the, the, the drama that they're in. Sometimes you tell them, probably the best advice I could give you is just be quiet. You need to ask God for the spirit to shut up. And let the situation handle itself. And we all know people we've told that to, and they don't do it. See, that person has no peace in their life. Do you have peace in your life today? Do you have peace even in the midst of everything that's going on in our society? As crazy our government is today, there's no peace in our government. There's no peace in this country. We are a divided country. 
It used to be divided in, in black and white by, by race. It still is. Now you're divided by vaccinated and unvaccinated. And even more so, you're divided by being a Democrat or Republican. Is so you got to pick a side. Which one are you going to be on? There's no peace in that. Jesus tells us in the midst of our hardship that we get a peace that passes all understanding. What does that mean? It means in the midst of a struggle, in the midst of your pain that you're going through. Maybe you're dealing, as we prayed for this gentleman, Randy, that's dealing with, with cancer. I imagine there's some peace that's not there in his life. But this peace, is that, this peace that passes all understanding is when we have Christ within us, in the midst of that, there's still a peace. When my mother was passing away. 45 days from the time she was diagnosed to the time she passed away. It's been about six years now. I remember sitting by her bedside talking with her. What little that she, uh, she, re she could talk. And uh, she looks at me and she goes, I think I'm pretty sick, aren't I? I was like, yeah, you are. She had stage four ovarian cancer. Very aggressive form. And she goes, I th think I'm pretty sick. I was like, yeah. She goes, that's okay. I'm going to be all right. My mom was a godly woman. And see what that was? That was the peace that passed us all understanding. And she knew that if, whether she was going to be healed here or pass away, she knew a healing was coming her way because she had a peace in her life. Her pastor walked in and there was another lady in her church that was going through cancer. And that was the first thing my mom said was, how's so-and-so doing? Pastor Jeff's like, oh, she's doing fine. We're not here to talk about her though. We're here to talk about you. And I'm here to see you. She said, no, that's okay. I'm fine. I'm going to be okay. Don't worry about me. I want to know how she's doing. How's the family doing? She called us all of his kids into the room. We had that mask on at that time. Because we were, at the time when she went in, they weren't real sure uh, her immune system was shot and everything from her one chemotherapy treatment. So we all had masks on. And, and um, she looked at us and she says, now there's going to be, she says, I'm concerned about your dad over here. He's crying. We're all upset about what was going on. So your dad's upset, he's crying, and I don't like that. So, so, so from this point forward, there's no crying in this room. Of course, we all got our mask all the way up here so she can't see us crying. <laughs> we didn't want her to have to, she said, everybody guys are pulling their mask up. She said, there's no more crying in this room. I'm going to be okay. You take care of your dad because I'm going to be fine. See, that's a piece in the midst of death. She knew what she was facing. She knew. But in the midst of that, there was a peace that she had in her life. That everything's going to be okay. All the hardship that she had to deal with then, she endured through it. And one thing God showed me, after a couple days, my mom, based, I will just say she slipped into a coma. She became non-responsive in a sense. And one thing God showed me was that, yea, though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. As hard as that was, I hung on to that. I believed until she took her last breath that God was going to heal her. And even then we rejoiced that God, God healed her. Do you have a peace like that in your life today? Do you have a peace that if you're laying on your deathbed today, that everything's going to be okay in your life today? Think about that for a moment. It's not about making peace with people. I need to make peace with the Tolson family before I die. It's not about that. We don't need to make peace, do we? Okay, good. <laughs> Clarify. <laughs> Maybe something I don't know or whatever. But uh, it's about knowing that between you and God, everything's okay. I had my heart attack. I laid there on that cat lab table. And I asked God that question. I said, God, I think everything's okay between me and you. Do you think everything's okay? Because at that time, I'm asking because my opinion didn't matter. Your opinion, if you think you and God are okay, doesn't matter. What it matters is what God thinks. And you had that peace in your life to know that should you pull out on this highway, this, this road out here, and get hit, and that's the end of life, that you're going to heaven today. It's a peace that passes all understanding. So what the Israelites were dealing with, constant turmoil, it was like, it was like, we're going to rinse, we're going to wash, we're going to repeat. We're going to rinse, we're going to wash, we're going to repeat. And that was their lives. It's a constant cycle. 
and this peace that they had, just that they wanted, was to them was just an absence of conflict. I just don't want conflict anymore. And we equate that to peace because it would give them some sense of security if they weren't getting attacked. And that's how peace is kind of referred to in our society today. I mean, how many times have we turned on the news over the last year and heard about the shootings or the rioting or a terrorist attack or drama coming out of Washington, drama coming out of Indianapolis? Every time we turn on the news, it's drama, it's, it's shootings, it's this person did this wrong, this person's wrong in this way. We hear about, oh no, it's another variant that's come out and it's, it's fear that we, 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 we sow into people to, to, I don't know, I guess contain them, whatever it may be. It's not just about the, these, this COVID stuff that's going on, it could be anything. We hear more about fear. And I believe if our leadership would step up and say, yes, I know there's some problems going on, but we will get through this together. We're going we're gonna to fight this. We're going to win this. This isn't being political when I say this, but I don't agree with what our president did the other day. For those who are unvaccinated, you're going to live a, this is going to be a horrible winter for you. That there's going to be sickness and illness and death. That's the wrong message to send to the country. Amen. It really was. And it doesn't matter if he's a Democrat or Republican in the, in, in the House. I don't care who said that. That was the wrong message to send to our country. That's fearing, that's a sowing fear, a sowing strife into the country. Our country is pitting families against each other. Well, you're vaccinated, you're not. You need to tell on those who aren't. Everybody has their own feelings about what's going on and if you should be vaccinated or not. That's your choice. That's your God-given right. That's your American right to have that decision. It's not my responsibility to tell you yes or no. But we live in a world today, in a country today, it's sowing fear in everywhere we go. Yeah. I'll tell you a simple way it sows fear. Who here wants to go to Chicago today? I'm a diehard Cub fan. I was thinking, you know, my daughter-in-law is from Colorado. She's never been to Wrigley Field before. So that's a gorgeous stadium. I got to take her. And I thought to myself, how safe is that? How safe? I mean, I just serious was my thought. was, How safe is that? That's the fear that we see that's out there. There's no peace there. So peace in, in the lives of the people in Chicago. You never know. It used to be on the outskirts or in the suburbs or the, the certain areas of Chicago you knew that it was gonna, there was going to be problems in. You knew if you just stay away from that, it doesn't matter anymore. There's no peace in our country today. I feel there's been this, we've regressed. We've fallen in this trap of, a, it's like high school, middle school drama that we're dealing with. But the good news is that God desires us to live in peace. That's why he gave us his son, the Prince of Peace. In the midst of these storms that's raging around us, these hardships, these struggles going around us, one thing we must understand, we'll never have true peace apart from God. His name, his nature, and his character is peace. And everything we pursue in life, everything people pursue in life is all around a pleasure that will bring them peace. The drug addict pleasures himself with the addiction of the drugs and all they really want is peace. That's why they go after it more and more. We have, we've got our jobs, we work more and more because we want money, because we believe buying the boats and the cars and having the, the, the winter homes, that having all this will bring us a peace to, in our life today. Everywhere we look, people are looking for peace. They don't want struggles in their, their, their families, but also they're looking for peace of mind. They deal with anxiety. They deal with depression. We're dealing with suicide. And all we're doing is looking for peace. And people drive more and more towards things because all they do is long for peace in their hearts. There's like a hole there that they're trying to fill with the things of this world. But they'll never find that. 
They'll never find the peace in this world that they're looking for. We can't find peace in created things. And Jesus knew this. Hey, he knows you better than you know yourself. And he was born into this world, this country, had only known captivity and conflict. They've known heartache, struggles, loss, hopelessness. There's stress. There was no rest. There was no peace. The anxiety, the depression that was sitting in. And that's what Jesus was born into. And the world we live in today is not any different than what that was going on then. It just looks a little different, but it's not. And we need that Prince of Peace. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus told his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Now as the world gives, gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Catch that. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. This peace that Jesus was talking about was this what means of rest, of, of quiet or a stillness within our heart. It's not the absence of trouble, but it exists. The peace exists in the midst of the trouble. And it pushes through all, this, all these disturbing circumstances that we have that life throws at us. This peace pushes through all that and gives us this ability to be calm and to endure. Even in the face of extreme struggles, even in the face of death, there's a peace that we have. This peace doesn't eliminate that conflict. It doesn't eliminate that trouble, but it gives you the ability to get through the mess that's in front of you. And when Jesus told the disciples this, he understood that things were about ready to get rough for them. He understood what was coming for them. That's why in John 13, 16, 33, he says, I have said these things to you that in you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He told them, you're going to have struggles, you're going to have hardships, but then in me you have peace. That's what Jesus gives us. And that's what Isaiah was proclaiming to the Israelite nations, was that in the midst of everything you see, I have peace for you. I'm sending you a son that's going to be the prince of peace. Do you look around and all you see is turmoil? You got to put this in the context of what was going on. All the turmoil, they needed to know what peace was. They needed a calm voice in the middle of a storm. And people today have all these storms raging around them and it's going so loud that they can't see or hear what God's doing in their lives. All they see is, a, is, a, is Christ on the cross and what they can't see because of everything going around is the empty tomb on the backside. That's the peace he gives us. We see the mess, but we can't see the peace that comes out of this. It's a peace that God wants us to have. As we end this year, it just seemed like 2020 and 2021, there really was no break in between the two years. You can lump them into a two-year cycle, really. It's been a mess since the spring of 20. And we don't know what this next year is going to bring. But I really believe God wants to do a new thing in us. But one of the biggest things, he wants to give us a spirit of peace. That when we walk into 2022, that we're going to have this spirit of peace about us. That no matter what comes in front of us, no matter what we see in our families, in our own lives, in our jobs, in our, in our economy. That no matter what happens, that we have a, a, a spirit of the Prince of Peace within us. That we can look at it and say, you know what, you may try to kill me. You may try to destroy me. But I'm enduring this thing. Amen. Amen. And it may be hard at times. I'm going to tell you. He just said it right there. Uh, John 16, 33. He says, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. He didn't say, hey, because you are a born again believer going to heaven. Then you're going to have no more problems. That would be nice if he said that. That would be This church would be packed. If everybody knew that, hey, if I just become a Christian and follow Jesus, I have no problems, you would be able to, we would have buildings that would contain the people. But he told us, you're going to have problems. Young adults, you're going to have some struggles coming up. 
You're going to have struggles in school. You're going to have struggles in, as you begin life. Our seniors, you're going to have struggles as, as you get towards the tail end of life. Those in the middle, we don't know what to do. We have struggles before us and struggles after us. We've got to try to endure through all this mess. But I'm telling you, if we will allow the Prince of Peace to come over us and, and dwell in that. So we saw today we make more about it than what it is. We're making a bigger deal about it than what it is. It seems like a big deal, but in the whole scope of eternity, it's not. And God says, I just want to pour out a spirit of peace upon you. That in the midst of everything... You're going to make it through in the midst of death, in the midst of job loss, in the midst of financial loss. It may be in the midst of broken families. It may be in the midst of broken health. God says, I want to pour out a spirit of peace upon you. Friend, can you come? In Mark chapter 4. says, starting in verse 35, says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, referring to Jesus, Let us go across the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. Keep this in mind. I never caught this. That's what I love about Scripture. How many times we read something a million times, and a million and one times, like, ah, light bulb. I didn't see this before. I never caught this. That said in verse 36, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? How many of us have asked God that before? God, do you even care that's what's going on in my life? And he awoke and rebuked the storm, rebuked the wind and the sea, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? You see, they were in a boat called life. And Jesus was with them in life. And a storm raged, taking on water, fearing you're going to drown. And all you need is to ask your Savior, your Father, for some peace. Let me ask you this. Stand with me across this place. Let me ask you this. What is the storm that's going on in your life today? Are you feeling overwhelmed today by what's been going on in society? Maybe what you see watching TV, quit watching it. Uh, maybe what you see going with our government, quit paying attention to them. But you see what's going on is causing you to not have any peace. It's bringing a, a sense of fear within you. What will our country be like at the end of next year, this time? What will our country be like for our children and our grandchildren? Maybe you fear that if one more thing happen, happens to you, that you're not going to make it through. And you're not going to be able to take it if you have one more thing. I can't do this anymore. As I've heard many people say, and they're not referring to, to situations, they're referring to life. I can't do life anymore because I can't take the pain and the struggle that's been going on. One thing we must remember that Jesus is in your boat of life. That's why he's the Prince of Peace. In the midst of heartache and the midst of struggle, he knows what you're going through. And he is the source of your peace. He was, is, and will be the answer to your problems. And he wants to give us a peace in the midst of all this so that we can experience the joy of the Lord in our lives. Amen. The enemy doesn't want you to experience that. Satan doesn't want us to experience joy. Because he knows that he, he can't take the joy of the Lord from you. We sing that song, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. 
You know what? That's the peace. The peace that I have the world can't give. And the world can't take it away from me. If your head bowed and every eye closed across this place today. If you're dealing with struggles and have no peace. I don't know what the situation you're going through. Any situation you're dealing with. If you don't feel there's peace in your life. I want you to slip your hand in the air. So I want to pray for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because Jesus wants to bring you peace, my friend. In the midst of everything you're going through, he says, I'm going to give you a peace that passes all understanding. Don't look to your left and don't look to your right, but look straight at the Lord. Look straight forward. Follow the path that God has laid in front of you. Because he wants to guide you and he wants to lead you. His word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. It shines just enough in front of us to know where we're going, but doesn't shine at the very end so we can't get scared of what's in front of us. But he will guide you and lead you in all peace. Because that is who he is. He's the source of your peace today. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, I praise peace over your people today. I pray John 14, 27 over your people when you declare the peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Hallelujah. 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 Is it well with your soul today, my friend? Do you have the Prince of Peace in your life today? Thank you, Jesus. Just sit here for just a moment and listen to the words of this song. If you know it, you can sing it with them. I want these words just to kind of just begin to flow over you today. The peace that passes all understanding. today, my friend. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. The drum shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well. Before I pray, if you're here and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, you've walked away from that commitment and you need to recommit yourself. Why don't you just slip your hand in there? I'm going to pray for you right now. Because Jesus has a plan for you, a plan to prosper you and a plan to grow you, not a plan to harm you. Hallelujah. Is it well with your soul this morning? Don't leave here without making sure it is. Father God, you saw all the hands have gone up across this place. Father, I pray peace over your people today. That in the midst of heartache, the midst of struggles and turmoils, the midst of stress and anxiety, depression, whatever it may be that our people are dealing with, Lord, your child is dealing with Father. So Lord, we realize that your Son is the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God and the everlasting Father, and our Prince of Peace. So no matter what we face, Lord, you are walking with us. And I ask, Lord, to, to let your peace fall upon your people today in a way they've never experienced it before. As we enter in next week into a new year, that the peace that passes all understanding goes before us and leads us and guides us. I thank you for that today, Jesus. So Father, as we leave today, let your peace go before us. Prepare our way. No matter what happens, we can say, it is well with my soul. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your presence today. For the time we can have in your house. And we give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.